Please remain standing. We're blessed this morning to have Brady Ash here to lead us in worship this morning. So he's going to get us started. So stand with us and sing. What's the first, what's the first song? Mighty to Save. Mighty to Save. With a key change. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. I feel my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender The Savior, He can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, so shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Oh, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Last time So shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Amen Amen. Take a moment and welcome your neighbor in the name of the Lord this morning. Well, as you come back to your seats this morning, yeah. 
you would please turn over on the back of your bulletins. I have just a few uh, announcements as far as uh, reminders of things going on uh, in the life of the church for the coming week. Uh, first of all, we're going to be having a youth group tonight for the junior high and senior high youth. And Rhonda, correct me if I'm wrong, junior high is at your house tonight. And uh, I think senior high is over at uh, Casey and Courtney's. And we're also having our confirmation class for any of our fourth and fifth grade students uh, who want to come to that. That's at 3.30 here at the church. Uh, so we'll be doing that this afternoon as well. And then we also are continuing our pastor's Bible study on Wednesday evenings. Uh, we have a meal at 6 o'clock and then we're following Jesus through uh, his time in Jerusalem leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday evening. So if you want to come and join us for that, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, are there any other announcements going on? I know we have a playoff basketball game, I think, tomorrow evening in Hamilton at 8 o'clock. Uh, boys play, so that's something going on in the community. Or is there anything else that we need to announce this morning? Okay. Uh, what joys can we lift up before the congregation this morning? Yes, Geneva. Jody Bella, congratulations. <laughs> we knew you wouldn't bring it up, so we decided we'd, all, <laughs> we'd make sure it got announced this morning. <laughs> Any other joys to lift up this morning? I have one. Mm -hmm. I had, Allison came in yesterday, yesterday, and we had a bachelorette party. So her future mother-in-law here, and her future bridesmaids. We had a good time. They had a good time and still made it to church on Sunday morning. I was pretty impressed with that. That's, that is pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. I got one. Yes, sir. Uh, Ruby slept through the night in her own room for the first time, and it was my shift. So. Hey! Oh, isn't he a lucky guy? My gosh, on his shift, she sleeps all the way through the night. My goodness. That is a joy. I remember it hadn't been that long ago since I've been there trying to get through that. So you bet when that baby sleeps all the way through the night, that's wonderful. Yes, Joanne. Glad to have Tilly. Tilly, good to have you with us. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. Nice to have you with us this morning. You bet. Ran out of bulletins this morning. That's always a good thing. We like that when we run out of bulletins. Okay. Sir. Amy's birthday is today, and she's 29 and older. Okay. <laughs> and she's probably down there referee those three boys that send them home and get ready for the commercial spirit show. Like well, she's wrangling them and getting them all straightened out, ready to go. So, well, we'll wish Amy a happy birthday. Y'all get on Facebook. Tell her happy birthday today. Yes. Raina is no longer allergic to chocolate. Yes, I saw that on Facebook. That is a that is a wonderful thing when you're not allergic to chocolate. That's a good thing. <laughs> she celebrated that in style, I think, didn't she? Yeah, that's a great thing. <laughs> Congratulations. 25th anniversary coming up on Tuesday for John and Rhonda. Congratulations. Awesome. Well, I have to say I'm pretty proud of a uh, little girls basketball team I'm coaching, fifth and sixth grade girls. They won both of their games yesterday, and so we get to be the number one seed going into our tournament this coming weekend. So they're playing really well, and that's fun to to get to know those girls and coach them uh, in basketball. So that's been fun on Saturdays. That's a joy for us. Yes, ma'am. I almost forgot. Uh, it's this Thursday that my granddaughter is coming home from Utah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's going to be there with her mother and her daughter. Great. And then, All right. Uh, You're... <laughs> be looking forward to that, though, right? Very good. Any other joys? All right, well, let's take a moment and look at our list of prayer concerns. Um, do have one to share with you from uh, out at Elberts. Uh, we need to be in prayer for, uh, and I've, hopefully I pronounced this right, Lamarless, Lamarless, Lamarless Manual uh, is going to be having a CT scan tomorrow in Graham uh, to check out a spot that they found on her lungs uh, in an x-ray. 
Uh, so they're just going to be double checking all of that and making sure that everything's okay. So she would like for us to remember her in prayer. Um, are there any other additions or updates to our prayer list this morning? Yes, Crystal. Okay, all right, so some more allergy testing going on for Raina this week. So we'll be praying for her. And Ian, that's just when I would call, but it sounds like the person may need some prayer, so if y'all just. Okay. Will do. Any other additions or updates on our prayer list? Yes, Candy. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that can be a really big challenge for caregivers. It sure can. So yes, we'll be praying for him. And I'm also going to throw this out there. I know he probably doesn't want me to, but Robert Mitchell's going to be having surgery on Tuesday. So we're going to be praying for you too, Robert, uh, as you have that, that procedure done. Any others this morning? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer today. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Let's pray. God, we come to you and we're just so thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, this day that we can come into your house and fellowship with each other, sing praises to you, hear your word. We pray that you would just open our hearts and minds to receive the word that you have for us today. May it be a word that would challenge us, renew us, remind us of our place in this world as your disciples and of our mission as your church. Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings, all of the joys that have been lifted up this morning. We give you praise and glory for each and every one of those things. Help us to never take the good gifts that you give us for granted, but to always give you thanks and praise for the blessings in our lives. And we lift up these this morning who are on our prayer list. We pray that you would be with them in the way that they need you the most right now, Lord. It may be a touch of healing that they need in their lives. Emotional healing, physical healing, spiritual healing. So help them to feel your presence in a tangible way this morning. Lord, it may just be that they need to feel your comfort in your presence with them today. And so we pray that they would have that, that they would feel your presence with them this morning. God, we pray for Lamarless Manuel. If she has her CT scan tomorrow, we pray that that CT scan would show that there is nothing to fear in her lungs, that there's nothing there to worry about. Lord, we pray as Raina has her test this week, allergy test that she would find that she's not even allergic to peanuts anymore and she doesn't have to worry about that Lord we pray for the call that just went out to our EMS this morning whoever that might be that uh, you would guide and direct those EMTs and paramedics to make the best decisions that can be made for the care of that individual we pray for Glenn as he cares for Candy's mom <coughs> We just pray that you would surround him with people who can give him the support and the help that he needs, that you would give him a time of rest as he cares for her. And Lord, we pray for Robert as he has his surgery on Tuesday. We pray that that would go smoothly with no complications and bring fast and quick healing into his body so that he can get back home doing the things that you've called him to do. God, we pray for this community. We pray for those this morning that 
that woke up today and without any thought whatsoever of coming into your house or even knowing who you are. We pray that you would help us as your disciples through our actions to be a light and a witness to them. We pray for our nation. Lord, as we near or come near another election, Lord, we pray that you would raise up men and women who at the local level, state level, national level, who understand what it means to be a follower of you. And that they would stand firm on the truths of your word. And God, we pray for your world. We pray for those this morning who are displaced by war, famine. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ this day who are worshiping you in secret and in hiding for fear that they might be discovered and even killed for their faith. We pray for their deliverance. Help us never to forget them in our prayers. And when we come to those times when we don't know what to say or even how to pray, help us to remember we can always pray with confidence the prayer you taught your disciples when you prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you want to, let's be standing for this tune. I know I couldn't sit still for this one. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name, the sun shining down on me, and the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name, on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name again. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name again. You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord 
Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Last time, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Amen. As you be seated, let the little children come and we'll have our children's message this morning. sent them on a little mission that's part of my message this morning you have any <laughs> any money okay yeah okay here you go all right thank you okay well first of all let's see um what did you all talk about in sunday school this morning be between you two okay uh, which one, which did you have? Cooking and science or theater or crafts? You didn't have crafts or music, so you had theater with KT. What did y'all do? We, <coughs> we learned about the supper before he died on the cross. Learned about the supper? Okay. What's that supper called? A feast. Okay, it's called a feast. And um, so when you went up there, before you went up there, you all ate breakfast, don't you? And then you have a checklist. And if you've been here five times, they don't have to be in a row, just five times you get to pick something, some kind of reward, don't you? Get a reward for being here. So show, show them what you got. A little puppy, any cute? Okay. And you got... Are you going to catch? What are you going to catch? You know what you could catch in here? You come get Lydia and y'all go catch butterflies. You can go chase butterflies and catch them. But that's your reward for coming to Sunday school. Do you know that in church we have another reward? What else do you get rewarded for? You get rewarded for something in school that you, or if you make good grades, do your parents reward you? For something? No? Come on, parents. They don't ground you? Okay. They don't ground you for good grades? They might ground you for a bad one? Okay. That's good. You, you keep out. Keep out of the grounding. Okay. All right. Um, well, you know, we have a reward in church. The highest reward, you all talked about the feast. Jesus said you will be rewarded in heaven. Did you all talk about that, maybe? Have you ever heard that before? How do you get rewarded in heaven? By coming to Sunday school five times? Maybe. <laughs> By saying that you love Jesus to someone else? He said you will be handsomely rewarded if you spread his word and if you tell other people or if you help someone else. Or if you give someone something, or if you do a kind thing, or say a kind word, or say a prayer for someone, then you will be handsomely rewarded in heaven. Okay, let's say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you for these children who have come to Sunday school. We know that you will reward them, and those that could not come, or that are here with us in church, they will also be rewarded because they are constant with you. Help us through this week and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
As the children are going back to their seats, if we could have some ushers gather, we'll have our morning offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless this offering. May we give with cheerful hearts. And may these funds be multiplied and used for your glory here in Throckmorton and around the world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please rise for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures He below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You may be seated. As we're doing in our Bible study on Wednesday nights, we're following Jesus through uh, his time in Jerusalem leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection on Easter Sunday. We're doing the same um, on Sunday mornings. You know, obviously we can't get into quite as much detail on Sunday mornings as we do on Wednesdays, but uh, we can still look at some of the events that happened in this time. And a lot of these things are things that people kind of, they glance at it, they may just kind of, you know, shuffle over certain passages of Scripture and they, and, they, and they miss things. And so that's the case, I think, with one of these passages this morning. It's not one that we necessarily enjoy hearing or reading. And, you know, as God laid this on my heart to preach this morning, I was thinking, why in the world does he want me to preach about this part right here, this story in Jesus' ministry here in Jerusalem? And then I started thinking, well... I think it's good that this chapter in Matthew is here because Jesus is getting on to and basically denouncing the religious leaders of the day because they had fallen short in doing the things that God had called them as a nation to do. Jesus, you know, God originally uh, picked the nation of Israel through Abraham to be his ambassadors to the rest of the world. The nation of Israel was supposed to share the good news of God to everybody else in the world and bring the whole world uh, into faith in God. That was the kind of the overall plan. They were his chosen people to do that. But over the course of many centuries, they had continually failed to live up to that standard and then continually failed uh, to do what God had called them to do. And now we, as Christians in the New Testament era, in the New Testament church, we have kind of taken on that responsibility. God has entrusted us through Jesus Christ to, to be his ambassadors to the world, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the rest of the world. And I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven one day, I don't want Jesus saying, woe to you, J. Gage. I would like for him to say, well done good and faithful servant. I don't want Jesus Christ to look at us as a congregation and say, woe to you. I would rather him say, well done, wouldn't you? And so I think it's good to, to read what he had to say to those religious leaders and, and understand what these things were that they were doing wrong, 
And not in a sense that we're saying the same things is wrong here. Not to say that we're doing these things either, but to help us not to do those things in the future. To help us to understand, oh, this is where they fall short. We've got to be careful not to slip into this ourselves as individuals and as a church. And so that's why we're going to be looking at the 23rd chapter of Matthew this morning where Jesus pretty much just hammers down on the religious leaders uh, for all of the things that they're doing. And there's some things in here that I learned um, that help make a lot of this make sense and I'm going to try to share that with you as we go through this passage. So we're going to be reading chapter 23 of Matthew. Hear what the word of the Lord says. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels of their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Now, before we go any further here, I need to make sure everybody understands what a phylactery is. That's kind of a big word. Um, back in the Old Testament, God had decreed that the Israelite people were always to keep the law in their, in their, in their minds. As a, he said in, in, in a, as a sign on their forehead or on their arm. And he meant this in a symbolic way. That they were supposed to keep the law in their minds and in through their actions with their hands. They were to keep the law. But the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders had taken this to an extreme literalism. And that they actually took little boxes and they would put in these boxes little small pieces of parchment with maybe the Ten Commandments or some other parts of the law on them. And they would seal them up in these boxes and they would literally tie them on their arms or, or on their foreheads. It would be kind of like us taking the little Gideon Bibles. Remember those little Gideon Bibles and tying them on our foreheads and walking around with them tied to our heads. Oh, look at me. I'm so religious. I'm so such a good Christian. And now the Pharisees, too, they were really bad because they made their boxes really big and, uh, you know, decorated with all this gold and everything. And, and they had these. It, doesn't that look, wouldn't that be funny? I mean, I think it's hilarious to see these guys walking around with these big boxes tied on their heads and wanting everybody to look at them and see how religious they were. And then they had these prayer shawls. They had these long tassels on them. The longer and more elaborate the tassels were, the more religious and pious and, and, and orthodox you were. And so they, they, this is what Jesus is saying. You know, they just want to be seen. It is all about the outward appearance. And then he continues on. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. And you are all brothers. And do not, on, do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Just exactly the opposite of everything that they were attempting to do. And then he goes into what's called the seven woes. You know, woe to you. You know, that was not a very good thing to have said to you in those days. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. What in the world is he talking about there? You know, the Pharisees believed that to do God's will was to observe the law. And not only the law, but all of the little petty rules and regulations that they had added to the law over the centuries, which numbered in the thousands. Okay, you had to follow all of these little rules and regulations in order to be a part of the kingdom. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. You know, the basic premise of the kingdom of God is love. 
It's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the essence of the law. But when the people would try to do their best to be a part of the kingdom, the Pharisees would present them with all these rules and regulations, just, you know, essentially just slamming the door in their face. Because there's no way anybody could keep all those. Even he says the Pharisees didn't do it. You know, you yourselves don't even follow all these rules and regulations. So how can you expect anyone else to? So they were, they were pushing people away with all these rules and regulations. Now surely that wouldn't happen in the church today, would it? I wouldn't think so. But at the same time, I wonder. You know, it hadn't been too many years ago that I probably would get in trouble for standing up here dressed like this as your pastor. You know, it's kind of forgiven now. <laughs> but it used to be there was a pretty strict dress code in the church, wasn't there? You know, and I was supposed to be standing up here in my coat and tie. You know, or robe. <laughs> if you really want to get strict about it, your robe with your stole and all that stuff, you know. And, and, and if people didn't have the proper dress, then they were kind of looked at funny when they came into the church. We, we luckily, thankfully, we're, we're, we've moved away from that in a lot of ways because it's not, it's not about that, is it? And then he goes on in the second one, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Ouch. Man, man he's not mincing words here, is he? You know, and what's he saying here? You know, Jews were persecuted in that day. You know, the Jews would not take part in all of the pagan rituals and festivals and all this stuff. And so they, they looked down upon them. They were, they were hated by all the other cultures of that day and age. Yet at the same time, there was, this, uh, there was this thing about Judaism that was appealing to some people. You know, the Jews had a very strict moral code. And some people really were attracted to that. Living in a culture that was very immoral and corrupt. And they kind of they kind of like that part about it. This this notion of there just being one God instead of hundreds of gods was kind of appealing to some people. And so there were Gentile people who converted to Judaism during this time. But the problem was is that oftentimes when they would convert from paganism to Judaism, they would become even more fanatic about following the law and the rules and regulations than the Pharisees who had converted them. I mean, they got on fire for this new religion that they had. And the problem is what Jesus is saying is, is the Pharisees, they weren't so much interested in leading others to God as they were more interested in making more Pharisees. See the difference? You know, and he's saying, you guys are going out there winning converts and turning them into you instead of bringing them to me and making them have a relationship, or having them have a relationship with me. And I know today we don't seek to convert people to Judaism, but we have missionaries that go out into the world and are hopefully making disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the dangers we have to be aware of, we have to be careful of, is that uh, we don't want to be out there making, you know, I know this, sorry this offends anybody, but we're not out there to make more Methodist or more Baptist or more Presbyterians. We're out there to make disciples. And, and, and my, you know, if I'm ministering to somebody, if I'm witnessing to someone and I lead them to Jesus Christ, I'm going to be really thrilled if they choose to come and worship with us here in our church, but I'm not going to judge them if they go choose to worship somewhere else. Because it's more about having a relationship with Jesus than going to a particular building on Sunday morning. But that's not, the Pharisees had lost that. They had lost that whole uh, concept. And they were more interested in making more Pharisees than they were disciples. And then he says, woe to you blind guides. 
You say, if someone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by, one, and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Now, this is a really long way of basically saying, you know, if you're going to swear an oath, keep it. Because the Pharisees and the religious leaders had gotten really good at figuring out ways to swear something to somebody and have a little back door and a little way out of it if they could get it. To evade that oath. You know, so they would swear by this or by that, knowing, thinking that they could get out of that oath if they, if they needed to. And Jesus is saying, you know what? First of all, probably shouldn't be swearing oaths, period. But if you're going to swear an oath, God hears it. He knows your heart and you better keep it. It's really as simple as that. If you swear an oath, you keep it. And then he says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. <laughs> what in the world is he talking about there? Strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now the Pharisees were so absolutely meticulous about tithes that they would tithe even a tiny clump of mint. You know, mint, dill, and cumin were spices used in people's kitchens. I mean, they're not going to grow a whole lot of that stuff. But they would tithe every little piece of that. Can you imagine bringing that to the altar, just your little piece of mint? Here's my tithe of my mint. And yet these same men could be guilty of corruption and injustice. They could be hard and arrogant and cruel, forgetting the claims of mercy. They could take oaths and pledges and promises with the deliberate intention of evading them. In other words, many of them kept the trifles of the law and forgot the things that really matter. And unfortunately, that spirit isn't dead. There are many who wear the right clothes to church, carefully hand in their offerings, adopt the right attitude at prayer. They're never absent for Holy Communion. And yet they're guilty of being irritable, bad-tempered, selfish with their money, not doing their honest share of the work. There are people who are full of good works, who serve on all kinds of committees, yet whose children are lonely for them at night. There's nothing easier than to observe all of the outward actions of religion and yet be completely irreligious. There's nothing more necessary than a sense of proportion to save us from confusing religious observances with real devotion. And that's where the story of the gnat and the camel come in. You know, the Jew, they were very particular about what was clean and unclean. And they would take wine and they would strain it through like, like cheesecloth. They would strain it through that into a cup just to make sure there was nothing unclean in it. And so they would be so meticulous, even this little flying insect, this little gnat, they would make sure that they got all of those out of there before they drank the wine. And yet they would ignore justice and mercy, just like they'd swallow a camel and worry more about the gnat. That's where that little phrase comes in. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the outside of the cup and dish, and then first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside also will be clean. Now I told you they had lots of rules and regulations. Lots of little things you had to follow. Listen to just a sample of this. 
Okay. An earthen vessel that is hollow becomes unclean only on the inside and not on the outside. And it can only be cleansed by being broken. That was one of their rules. The following things could not ever be unclean. A flat plate without a rim. An open coal shovel. A gridiron with holes in it for roasting grains of wheat. On the other hand, a plate with a rim or an earthen spice box or a writing case, those can become unclean. A vessels made of leather, bone, wood, and glass, flat ones do not become unclean. Deep ones do. If they are broken, then they become, they become clean again. Any metal vessel, which is at the same time smooth and hollow, can become unclean. But a door, a bolt, a lock, a hinge, or a knocker can never become unclean. If a thing is made of wood and metal, then the wood can become unclean, but the metal can't. Isn't that crazy? And these regulations seem crazy to us, yet these are the same regulations they kept meticulously. And what was crazy is that it didn't matter to them what was in the cup. It didn't matter what was in the cup. It could have been obtained by cheating, extortion, theft. It might be poison. As long as the cup was clean, then it didn't matter. Totally backwards the way it should be. Jesus is saying, you know, clean the inside first. It's not about what you look like. It's about what's on the inside. And we don't get this. We think this is so foreign to us, yet churches can get into this too, can't we? I mean, I've literally seen churches nearly split over the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Or Lord, forgive me, put a screen and a projector up in the sanctuary. Or have, or have somebody lead worship with a guitar instead of the organ. You know, we can get so caught up and all these little outward things that we don't even pay attention to what's going on on the inside of things. We gotta be careful. We don't wanna fall into that same trap. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs. which does it look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And what's he talking about there with whitewashed tombs? Okay, in Jesus' day, many times people were buried in tombs, and those tombs were placed on the wayside. They were placed along the roadways that led to different cities and towns. And obviously, if you touched a tomb, you became unclean. And you couldn't go to the temple. You couldn't worship in the temple because you were unclean because you touched this tomb. So at Passover time, when these millions of people were coming into Jerusalem, the Pharisees would go out in the weeks beforehand and they would whitewash all of the tombs on the roads leading into Jerusalem. They would paint them white so that the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for Passover wouldn't accidentally touch any of them. They would see them, and they wouldn't touch them, because if you touched a tomb on your way to the Passover, then you didn't get to take part in all the Passover stuff. And so it was done as a warning, okay, to show them that this is not a clean thing. You don't want to touch this. And Jesus is saying, you guys are just like those whitewashed tombs. You look so pretty on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead stuff. And it can still happen. People can walk with bowed heads and reverent steps and folded hands in the posture of humility and all the time be looking down on people that they regard as sinners. Their very humility may be the pose of pride instead. And it is a very tempting thing, isn't it? To compare, isn't it? Well, I mean, I may, I may make some mistakes, but I'm, at least I'm not as bad as those people. 
At least I don't do what they do. You know, and we try to build ourselves up, you know, and make ourselves be a little better, you know, than everybody else. And, you know, it's just a temptation of our flesh. We, we don't want to see ourselves for, you know, as falling short or not, or not being, well, all that we could be. So we compare ourselves to others and we rationalize things. You know, well, I may do this, but, you know, everybody has their faults, right? I mean, everybody has something that they do, but at least it's not as bad as those people over there. And so we rationalize things. But here's the only comparison that we as Christians should be making, friends. And that's to look in the mirror each day and ask, how do I compare with Jesus Christ? Am I becoming more and more like Jesus Christ? Because if we do that each day, then I promise you that pride is probably not going to be a part of our nature. Because we're always going to see things within ourselves that we need to work on in order to be more and more like Jesus. And it's going to be a lot harder to judge others if we do that. And finally, he finishes by saying, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, now if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we, have, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. And here Jesus is charging the Jews, telling them that the taint of murder has been in their history from the very beginning, and it's not over yet. The scribes and the Pharisees tended the tombs of the martyrs, and they, oh, they claim, man, you know, if we had lived back in the days of Jeremiah, we, we never would have persecuted him. If we had lived in the days of, of Hosea, we never would have persecuted him. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you would have. Because you're persecuting me. And you're going to persecute all the ones that I send after me. I mean, think about what happened to Paul. Think about what happened to Peter and John and all of the disciples. They killed them. Just like they did, you know, the other prophets that had come in the Old Testament. He says, from, he says that the righteous people from Abel to Zechariah were murdered. Now, why did Jesus choose Abel and Zechariah? Now, the murder of Abel, we all know that story. Genesis, Cain killed Abel, all right? The very first murder that took place. Abel was righteous in God's eyes, and Cain murdered him. But what about Zechariah? Why did Jesus choose Zechariah? Now, Zechariah's story is told in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. In the days of the king Joash... Zechariah rebuked the nation for their sin, and Joash stirred up the people to stone him to death in the temple court. So why is Zechariah chosen? Well, here's why. This was interesting to me. In the Hebrew Bible, you know, they have the same books in the, in the Hebrew Bible that we, that we have in our Bibles. Genesis is the first book, just like it is in ours. But unlike ours, they, they put their books in a different order. And 2 Chronicles is actually the last book of the Hebrew Bible. And so by saying Zechariah, Jesus is saying that from the beginning to the end, the history of Israel is the rejection and the slaughter of those sent from God, from Abel to Zechariah. And then Jesus sends a prophecy that all of the blood of the prophets will be avenged on this generation. And if you know your history, it was so. 
because in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and they tore the temple down stone from stone and it's never been rebuilt since. So what does this all have to do with us? I think it just has to say to us, it's a reminder. You know, a lot of times you've heard this phrase. If you have an older brother or sister, you probably heard your parents say this. You know, I hope you learn from their mistakes. You ever heard that before? You know, do you, you see how your brother messed this up? I hope you learn from what they've done and don't do that same thing. You know, that's what we tell our kids. Learn from others' mistakes. I mean, to me, this is I hope that we as the church of Jesus Christ can learn from the mistakes that the Pharisees made that we won't end up making the same mistakes as the church going forward. And that we will truly be Christ ambassadors to the world and we will truly help usher in the kingdom of God in this world. So that when history judges us, we won't be seen as people who hindered God or kept God from doing what he was wanting to do in the world, but that we will be seen as a people who helped God and did the right thing. And so it's a good way for us to look at their mistakes and say, hey, are we on track here? Or are we allowing ourselves to get caught up in some of the same stuff that they got caught up in? Individually and as a body. And if so, we need to take care of those things. We need to say, okay, stop. We, just don't, we don't need to be so concerned with outward appearances. We need to be more concerned with the heart or whatever it might be. So I think it's a good lesson for us to learn. A good thing for us to remember as we move toward Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we have together, Lord. I thank you for this chapter. Even though we don't like to read it, and sometimes, Lord, it means even step on our toes just a little bit. It's a reminder that we need to learn from the past so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. So give us wisdom, Lord. Guide us and direct us as we seek to be your ambassadors to this broken world around us. As we seek to make disciples and help them understand what it truly means to have a relationship with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Almighty, 
awesomeness and is to come with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Receive this benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and to the honor of glory of God the Father, remind you it's not about what we look like. It's not about what building we worship in. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's an intimate, in the heart thing. That is where the kingdom begins. May it be so with you. In Jesus' name. Amen.